lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Now I emphasize, I never tried to mix or combine my political views with my theological views or my Christian convictions. But I do believe in biblical principles applied to all areas of life, even though I would not want to be seen as identifying with or endorsing any political candidate or supporting any party. I'm in fact an independent personally. Nonetheless, Jesus never forbade self-defense. He said if you, you knew what hour a thief was going to break into your house, you would defend it. Another place he said, bring two swords. It's interesting to note that the idea of gun control being propagated in the black community was done in the Jim Crow South. They did not want black families or black people to be able to defend themselves from the Ku Klux Klan. Hence the anti-Second Amendment gun control agenda was pushed in the black communities in the American South by the Democratic Party, disarming blacks so they'd be at the mercy of the Klan. Again, that's the root of this. That is the very source of this. With the outrageous amount of gun crime taking place in the inner cities, why should honest Afro-American citizens not be able to defend themselves? Remember, for every black person shot by a policeman, black or white, 58 were shot by other blacks. In black-on-black -black violence, most of the gun uh, drug-related in the inner cities and in the Afro-American community. Why should Afro-Americans not have the same right under the Second Amendment to defend themselves and their homes and their families as any other American? Um, yet this is being thrust upon black people as something in their interest. Well, that's what the Klan said. It's not in their interest. Again, I'm not trying to push any political agenda. I'm simply looking at the facts. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio here with James Jacob Prash, live in the States. Jacob, one of the believers had the question, what is the mark of Cain and what kind of ramifications has a misinterpretation of that uh, been throughout history? First of all, there have been a certain amount of confusion by people who obviously don't read or understand the Hebrew language, confusing the curse on Canaan in the prophecies of Noah following the flood in Genesis of chapter 9 in post-Diluvian era of, of biblical history uh, in Genesis 9.25 with the curse on Cain, of the brother of Abel, in the book of Genesis, chapter 4. These are two different words with two entirely different spellings. The two texts are not even related, but we will briefly look at both of them. The question today is, how is this mark of Cain, or the teachings about Cain, being misapplied, or how have they been misapplied historically? Let me preface my response by pointing out I am not attempting to make any political statement or endorse any political party or endorse any political candidate. What does the Bible say about the African race, about black people? Tragically and unfortunately, the point of commencement among racists is usually the mark of Cain or the curse of Cain. That should not be the point of commencement. The point of commencement should be the three sons of Noah, Japheth, from where the European and Asian nations ethnically derive, Shem, where the Semitic nations, such as Jews and Arabs, derive, and Ham, which is where the African nations and certain others derive. The descendants of Ham, who populated Africa, were called Cushites, Cushites, or Cushim, from the land of Cush. 
in the ancient Middle East, people did not know about the Congo, or they did not know about South Africa, or about Zambia, or Zimbabwe. But they did know about the Horn of Africa. They did know about Sudan, and about the people who are the forebearers of the modern Nubians in Upper Egypt. These were called Kushites, from the land of Kush, often associated with Malki Shava, the Queen of Sheba. Hence, the Hebrew term, the Hebrew term for a black African is the same as the Hebrew term for an Ethiopian. Most of the black people they knew from Sudan into Eritrea, Somalia, the Horn of Africa, that area, the people with the darkest skin who the ancient Hebrews knew were from the land of Kush, Kushites. So first of all, anthropologically, there's a false point of commencement in dealing with what the scripture says about black people, about black Africans, the curse of Cain. Let's begin to dispel this ridiculous myth to begin with. The curse of Cain, or the mark of Cain, commences with Cain, the brother of Abel, in the book of Genesis chapter 4. That term that God put on the brother of Abel after Abel was murdered is called an ot in Hebrew, ot. And it's the Hebrew term for a letter of an alphabet, a letter of an alphabet. It is not the only place God has put a letter of an alphabet on the forehead marking people. In Ezekiel, those who escaped the judgment were given the mark, which is, of course, replayed in the book of Genesis. That mark was the letter Tav, which was written more like a cross in the original post canonic Hebrew, not in the modern Hebrew script or the Middle Ages Hebrew script or the Masoretic Hebrew script, but in the older Hebrew script, you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls and earlier, that is, or the Dead Sea Scrolls, certainly Quran, that is the way the letter was written, and it was shaped more like a cross. I don't know what the letter was. <laughs> it may have been this cross mark. We cannot say for sure. But we do know is that it was not a curse. It was a sign of divine protection. Cain represents fallen man. God tells him, Sin's desire is for you, and you must master it. He was afraid he was going to be destroyed, so God put a mark on him, and it was something protective. We read in the book of Genesis, chapter 4. You are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. And he goes on saying this, Behold, thou hast driven me this day from the face of the ground, in verse 14, and from the face I shall be hidden. I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and it will come about that whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, lest anyone finding him should slay him. Hence it was a mark of protection. How these racists, who are usually hyper-Calvinists, identified black people with the descendants of Cain, the brother of Abel, and took a mark that represented something good and positive despite Cain's sin, and turned it into something negative, a mark to be cursed by God, I do not know. It makes no logical sense, and it certainly makes no scriptural or theological sense. It's a complete nonsense. The history of biblical anthropology in the table of nations in the book of Genesis begins with the descendants of Noah. The three sons of Noah, Shem, Japheth, which comes from the word pretty or beautiful, and Ham. Let's look at the next text in Genesis 9.25, where some people get this belief. Not understanding that Canaan in Genesis 9 and Cain in Genesis 4 are spelled completely differently. They're not the same word in Hebrew. Genesis chapter 9, we look at this. Verse 25, so he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, of that of Adim, he shall be to his brothers. This curse that we read about was prophetic. 
It was on the nation of the Canaanites. It was literally and historically fulfilled with the exodus and with the invasion of Joshua. Those were the Canaanites. They were this wicked civilization that practiced ritual bestiality and human sacrifice of their children. God told the Hebrews to destroy them. It was that one particular nation. It was not a curse on Cush. It was a curse on the Canaanites who Joshua drove out. They were a wicked, wicked nation. They prefigure what fallen man is going to be like at the end of the age. If you read the Torah carefully with the prohibitions that God gave the Hebrews and the Pentateuch, do not do the things that the nations practice that I will drive out before you. If you want to see those terrible things, like the, the grossest of sexual acts imaginable and human sacrifice, the Hebrews were not to do that because that's what the Canaanites were doing. Yes, they were an accursed people, but it has nothing to do with the people of Africa generally. The term would have been Kush, and it's not there. Most of what the scriptures say about black Africans, that is the Cushing, the Cushites, is quite positive. If we remember when Absalom died, the unfaithful messenger, Abimelech, did not want to bring the bad news to David. It was a black messenger, a Cushite, African convert to Judaism, who was the true and faithful messenger, who was not afraid to tell David the tragic truth. We see that when Jeremiah, a type of Christ, was thrown into the pit and left to die, it was a black African believer in the true God who rescued him. When we go to the New Testament, Jesus said, take the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. So you have the actual people who are Hebrews, then you have the Mongol Jews, the Samaritans, but then you have the Goyim, the ethnon in Greek, the nations. The first non-Jew, total non-Jew, inclusive of the Samaritans, if we want to consider the Samaritans broadly defined semi-Jews or Mongolized Jews, the first total non-Jew who came to faith in Jesus, <coughs> of which there's any biblical record, is in the book of Acts, chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, again, a Cushite. So the first person saved from the nations, other than the Jews, that we have a record of, who became a believer in Jesus, is a black African. We have to understand something. The book of Acts only gives us, basically, one direction that the gospel spread. That is via the northern Levant into Europe, the Greek-speaking world, and then into Rome. The gospel also spread east. The gospel also spread south into Africa. The gospel also spread northeast. The Armenian Empire Christianized well before the Roman Empire, but people don't know that generally speaking. There are historical records of Thomas the Apostle going as far east as India and of Matthew to Ethiopia. Most of them, of course, were martyred. They were all martyred except the Apostle John. Black Africans accepted the gospel. Although I do not agree with all of their doctrines as they have evolved, the Coptic Church of Egypt and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, or the Ethiopian Church, the Church of Ethiopia, which combines Judaism with Christianity, are quite ancient. They are quite old in, in their antiquity. They've been around a very, very long time. They have roots that would parallel the origins of Christianity in Europe, probably at least as old as the Eastern Orthodox church or the Roman Catholic Church. Black Africans responded to the gospel, even though there was, of course, opposition and persecution as there was everywhere. The Berbers were Indo-Europeans who populated North Africa 
forced to convert to Islam in the Muslim invasions. But the gospel did relatively well in Africa, relatively well into black Africa. Again, the first convert to Christ, who was not from a Jewish background in any sense, if we include the Samaritans, of which we have a biblical record, is the black African convert to Judaism with Philip the Evangelist. Most of what the scripture says about the Kushites is positive. There are exceptions. There was one war where the Kushites had a wicked king in the Old Testament. But that's only speaking of Ethiopia. It's not speaking of all black people. What does the scripture say about black Africans? Well, that's what it says. Is the people of Kush, most of the ones who were named in the Old Testament, in fact, except for one king of, of Kush, all the other ones were spoken of rather positively. Same as we see in the New Testament with Philip the Evangelist. The scripture does not take a negative view of black people in any sense of the word. On the contrary, the scriptures broadly speak favorably of them. Rescuing Jeremiah, telling the truth to King David, reading Isaiah 53 while riding in a chariot and coming to belief. Now this, of course, relates way back to the history of the relationship between Israel and the Cushim and the days of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Separate story, I only mention it in passing. But this idea that the plight of black people and the poverty and the ignorance and the genocide that you see in things like this and the being a social underclass is, is, is the curse of Cain either from Genesis chapter 4, which is ridiculous, or from Genesis chapter 9, which is ridiculous. They're not the Canaanites who Joshua drove out. These things are absolutely absurd. They were invented by hyper-Calvinist proponents of the institution of slavery, trying to give some kind of a biblical justification so people claiming to be Christians can have slaves. What the New Testament said about slavery was quite negative. What the Old Testament said was negative. God would not allow Hebrews to own slaves. They only allowed indenturism, bond servants. At the year of Jubilee, they went free. They could have an option of remaining in the service of a benevolent master if they chose to. They had a ritual where a gold ring would be driven through the earlobe into the doorpost and so forth. However, that was optional. There was no <coughs> forced slavery. The bond servants had rights. You knocked their tooth out, they were automatically free before their indenture was up. God did not allow it. They were the Lord's people. He did not allow slavery. Even if a non-Jew converted to believe in the true God and worship the true God of Israel, you couldn't keep him as a slave or you couldn't keep her as a slave. God did not allow it. Judaism was unique in this sense. The Torah banned it. Not only did the Torah ban it, but a man-stealer, somebody who abducted people forcibly to make them slaves, that was a capital crime. If you went out and abducted people to turn them into slaves, the way the Muslims did and the way the Vikings did, in the Old Testament, that was a capital crime for the people of God. God's view was negative. Didn't allow it. And he certainly didn't allow it on the basis of race or anything else. Fast forward to the New Testament. 25% of the Roman Empire is slaves. Christians are being persecuted as it is. Jewish believers are being persecuted by the Sanhedrin. The church was then persecuted by the Roman Empire. Not only that, but with 25% of the population slaves, if you freed them, they would be socioeconomically displaced and have no means to survive. What the New Testament said was this. We can't apply God's law to a fallen world. That was something that only happened in theocratic Old Testament Israel. But what Paul wrote was, if you can get free, get free. And if you are a Christian who has slaves, if they don't want to go free, 
If they want to remain in your service, remember that's your brother. You don't treat him as a possession. He belongs to the Lord. You treat him as a brother. He has to respect your position. You have to respect his position. He's your brother. Much like employing a relative, a brother in your business or something. Yes, he's your employee, but he's also your brother. People would have been socioeconomically displaced with no visible means or viable means of survival. And it would have caused upheaval and increased persecution against the church. The Roman Empire was very sensitive to this because of the uprising of Spartacus historically. They were afraid of another slave uprising. And if Christianity could have been seen as something that was engendering or encouraging the uprising of slaves, they would have connected that with Spartacus and there would have been a further crackdown and persecution of the church. Paul dealt with the social and political and economic realities of the time, but he made it clear. You got a slave? <laughs> if he wants to be a slave, remember that's your brother. If they can get free, get free. But some people were better off having a Christian and you being in the service of that Christian than being in the service of the pagan world, who should be treated like a brother according to the teachings of the New Testament. The idea was, as the gospel prospered, and as the gospel became more prolific, that more people would become Christians and the institution of slavery would die of itself. That was the idea. Tragically and disgustingly, even after the Reformation, there were hyper-Calvinists, particularly Calvinists, who propounded the ideas of slavery, and their bogus theology had to do with the mark of Cain and the curse on the Canaanites. And often, in their ignorance, some people confuse the two, even though they're two entirely different and unrelated words in the Hebrew text. Now, those are the things we know from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and from Christian history. Let us deal further now with the realities. Mohammed called black people, when he first saw them from Ethiopia, raisin heads. The owning of slaves, particularly black slaves, continued in the Islamic world. The first countries to abolish slavery were Christian. The last to abolish slavery are Islamic, except that they haven't abolished it yet. If you were to go on things like the Slavery International website, you would see it is Muslim countries, Chad, Mauritania, Sudan, Niger, where wealthy Arabs and wealthy Muslims own black African slaves today in the 21st century. There's a man in Chad with 7,000 black slaves. The Muslims also made multiple attempts to invade Southern Europe and took Europeans as slaves. This was not unique, however, to Islam. The Crusades <coughs> were, of course, butchers subjugating other people but before the Crusades, the Vikings abducted people even from Ireland and England and Wales and Scotland as slaves. God did not allow this. It was a pagan practice. It's a shame and a disgrace that you had Calvinists doing what Vikings did, what jihadist Muslims did, and it still goes on. We have the absurdity today, you have people like Louis Farrakhan teaching that Christianity is a white man's religion and that Islam is the religion of black liberation. Go on YouTube and watch black African women being flogged mercilessly under Sharia in black African countries that have Islamic law. That doesn't happen in the Christian world. That happens in the Islamic world. You had a kind of Afro-Islam that combined animism with Islam that existed in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and even into certain areas, the 20th century. 
These Afro-Islamic believers had tribal chiefs. Again, they were mixing tribal animistic beliefs and ancestor worship and things like this, combining it with Islam. It was not that white people came and abducted blacks and took them as slaves to South Carolina, to Charleston, and to New Orleans. That's not what happened. It's not that Bristol was the slave market of Europe for black Africans. That's not how it happened. Because of Afro-Islam, slavery was already practiced in Africa. What white slave traders did was buy these slaves. They bought people who were already slaves, buying them from their tribal chiefs or from the chiefs of rival tribes who fought against them and conquered them and then sold them as slaves to Europeans. It was not that the white people went and took them as slaves. They were already slaves. They were held in slavery by other black Africans who were Muslim or a form of Islam. Again, elements of this still exist with Boko Haram. This is not all ancient. Be that as it may, they're already slaves and they were brought to the New World. The hyper-Calvinists of the South, again, began this Mark of Cain nonsense teaching to justify it. There was quite a controversy within the British Empire when black slaves in places like Jamaica began to respond to the gospel. There was a question, can black people even be saved? Why are you baptizing them? And there was division within the Anglican Church over the issue. Now again, this was not unique to the British. The Spanish conquistadors did the same thing to North American and South American Indians, particularly South and Central American Indians. The Jesuits did the same thing in the name of Catholicism at the behest of the conquistadors. They did the same things to the Incas, to the Aztecs, to the Mayans, and so forth. Blacks, however, were taken from Africa and transplanted as Afro-Caribbeans by the British and French. Or they were taken to the United States to work in agriculture, particularly the cotton fields. Fast forward. Right from the aftermath of the American Revolution, the issue of slavery was an issue. You had people like John Quincy Adams, who were opposed to it, very much so. And it became a North-South issue. You had people such as uh, Preston Books, who were advocates of slavery, and they bought into this whole agenda. You had other people um, who, who were trying to, to compromise and hold the country together. Uh, but eventually it would come to a head, inevitably, after slavery was abolished in the British Empire. America was next. Slavery was abolished in the British Empire following the rise of Methodism and John Wesley, who opposed it. Unfortunately, George Whitfield, who was a Calvinist, supported the institution of slavery and actually owned black slaves. Wesley was against it. We know the famous story of the author of Amazing Grace, the composer of Amazing Grace, who was a slave trader, John Newton, when his life was miraculously saved as a captain of a slave ship at a wreck at sea. He had a revelation of Christ and he was born again, composed to him Amazing Grace, and devoted the rest of his life to preaching the gospel and working against the institution of slavery. This idea of evangelical conversion and abolitionism went on for some time. It began in England. During the American Civil War, the British reckoned that the best light cavalry commander in the world was General Bedford Forrest from Memphis, Tennessee. He again was a personally wealthy plantation owner with a stock in slaves and in cotton. After the war, in reaction to the occupation of the South under what was supposed to be the Reconstruction, 
he forms and becomes the primary founder of the Ku Klux Klan. This is Bedford Forrest. Using the same cavalry techniques as he used as a Confederate white cavalry commander that so impressed the British, who at that time were the number one war power. However, later in his life, after undergoing an evangelical conversion and being born again, Bedford Forrest renounced his past sin. He renounced slavery, and he worked to bring about equality between the races on the basis of Christianity. Again, he became an American, John Newton. During the Civil War, he was hated. The Union generals referred to Forrest as a devil. He had brilliant cavalry tactics. He was almost unstoppable. He was so elusive they couldn't deal with him. They called him a devil. But he became a believer in Jesus, and it completely turned his heart to favor the black people that he once enslaved. This is the founder of the Klan who became a Christian and denounced what he did, denounced what the Klan was, and denounced racial injustice and bigotry because of his faith in Jesus. Christianity has always been the faith of black liberation. The civil rights movement came from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Christian Leadership Conference, Martin Luther King in the 20th century. The biblical influences were there. But going back to the 19th century, people like Frederick Douglass, and after that, people like George Washington Carver, the great black scientist, and people you know, like Booker T. Washington, the great black educator, but certainly Frederick Douglass, the first black human rights activist. These people were committed Christians. They were committed Christians. Martin Luther King went into theological liberalism because of his theological education. It was not conservative Baptist, it was liberal Baptist. But something appears to have happened to Martin Luther King at the end of his life. The world remembers his I Have a Dream speech delivered at the March on Washington on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. That was indeed a political speech. But his final speech before he was murdered by James Earl Ray, some say with the complicity of the FBI, some say, with some reason to say it, because of the remarks of J. Edgar Hoover himself, according to the testimony of his successor, Patrick Gray. That, before he was murdered, his last speech in Memphis was not a political speech. It was a sermon. Martin Luther King denounced Soviet communism and Chinese communism. He denounced these things in that speech and previously. Martin Luther King also denounced anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism. He was a supporter of Israel. His father and his family were Republicans because going back to Lincoln, the Republicans were the party of emancipation. The party of slavery were the Democrats and the party of Jim Crow were Democrats. Martin Luther King had something happen to him when he gave that last speech. He st stopped speaking politically at one point in that speech, if you watch it carefully on YouTube. And he said, I no longer care about these things. I only care about doing God's will. I've been to the top of the mountain, and my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He spoke of the return of Jesus. Then he was murdered the next day. Something happens when people have that kind of confrontation with the real Christ. Something. Quite a thing. But Islam, <laughs> to this day, to this day, wealthy Muslims own black African slaves. You'll find oil sheets from the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf going on private jets to poor black African countries, calling it employment contracts, but buying little girls, underage girls from their families for like $200, $400.
flying them back to the harems in Saudi Arabia. When questioned, and this was broadcast on television some years ago, they were saying, what's wrong with it? Our prophet Muhammad did it. Muhammad married Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakir, when she was six and took her virginity. When she was nine, he was 54. It's still going on, and the little girls are black. Black slaves in the 21st century, and who owns them? Not Christians, Muslims. Yet you've got people like Farrakhan and these others pushing this ridiculous agenda that Islam is the religion of black liberation and ends racism. Nothing could be further from the truth. Over the issue of slavery, you had a split in major American denominations. Why are there a Southern Methodists and ordinary Methodists in America? Because of slavery. The Southern Methodists followed a Calvinistic pro-slavery line. The others were opposed to it, following John Wesley. Why were there Southern Baptists and American Baptists? Because the Southern Baptists followed that same line, the American Baptist, the post slavery. In Islam, no such thing ever happens. There are still black slaves, yet black people are being told the lie that it was Christians who did this to them, and Islam is their hope of liberation. And many of them believe it. It's unbelievable what people can be manipulated into believing. Let's look at the historic facts, the historic truth. I do not make light of the plight of the inner city poor who are in disproportionately large numbers Afro-Americans. Bearing in mind there are poor white people, there are poor Hispanics, and unless they live close to a major population center or resort where they can benefit from untaxed casinos, there are poor Native Americans. It is not exclusively a black problem. Martin Luther King knew that, said that. But let's look at this. Haiti has been an independent black country since the 1700s. It's one of the poorest and most corrupt and unjust countries in the world. People in Haiti, a black country, an Afro-Caribbean country, would love to leave Port-au-Prince and live in a housing project in Chicago or Philadelphia. They'd be hitting the jackpot. Every country in post-colonial Africa, and I have been to most of them, certainly in East and Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Kenya, virtually every one of those countries had lower infant mortality, higher longevity, less unemployment, a more stable economy and political and legal system than they have in post-colonial Africa. Now, I don't like colonialism. I'm an American. Americans have never liked colonialism. They fought the British for their independence. America has been the only superpower in history that didn't colonize other people. When America conquered the Philippines, they conquered it from Spain, not from the Filipino people, and then gave them their independence. When America conquered Cuba, it conquered it from Spain, and then gave it its independence. Puerto Rico democratically elected to remain part of the United States because it was in the economic interest and political interest of the Puerto Rican people to do so. That was voluntary. Where people wish to be colonized, like the people in Gibraltar or Puerto Rico, I have no problem with it. But as an American, Americans don't like colonization. Unlike the British, the French, or any other world empire in history, going back to the ancient world, the United States has been the only superpower, the only world empire that didn't colonize other countries as such. As an American, I don't like it. It was the United States after World War II who pressured the British and French to decolonize. However, I know what happened once they did. 
Now, ethnically, my family is a combination of Irish and Jewish. Both the Irish and the Jews fought the British for their independence, as did the Americans. There is nothing in my family or my background, my heritage, my blood, my genes, my citizenship, nothing that would support colonialism. Unless it's a case like Puerto Rico or Gibraltar, where the people actually prefer it. That's something different. Because it's in their interest and they want it, then I have no problem with it. As long as it's the democratic will of the people who are colonized and they have equal rights and so forth. Why is this curse on Africa that every one of these countries was better off? I was against apartheid in South Africa. I was totally opposed to it. I thought it was based on bigotry and injustice. Yet since the end of apartheid, under the present government of the ANC, the African National Congress, black unemployment has more than doubled. Infant mortality has become much worse. Long black longevity has decreased radically. Blacks are living and less dying younger. Not to mention the outburst of crime that has terrorized people. What used to be political violence is now just plain crime. Why economically and in terms of employment and life expectancy, why were the black people of South Africa better off under the injustice of apartheid? Why have they exchanged one evil for another? Why were all these countries in Africa in a situation they were better off under the British or French than they are now? Sierra Leone and these countries, terrible things have happened. What happened in Uganda under Idi Amin? What happened in the Central African Republic? The engineered famines deliberately caused in Biafra what was done to the Christians by the Muslims in Nigeria and is being done by the Muslims against the Christians in Nigeria. Why has this happened? Some people would have us believe it is the curse of Cain. I do not believe it is the curse of Cain. I believe these things have happened for explicable reasons that are not just political and economic and sociological, but theological and scriptural. You look at countries like Singapore that became independent in Asia at the same time of the countries in Africa became independent. Look how Singapore has leaped into the 21st century as a high-tech, wealthy country, highly prosperous. Why have these countries in Asia that were decolonized prospered while Africa has gone backward? Now, again, there are human explanations for some of these things. Africa is tribal. Europe imposed a national system of social and economic and political organization on a tribal culture that has never worked, artificially creating nations that they held together with the force of European military might. Once that ended, these nations turned on each other, and in Africa, the underlying problem driving the injustice is tribalism. Who's ever tribe gets to be president or in control of the government, favors that tribe to the detriment of the other tribes. That's a major problem throughout most of post-colonial Africa. But it's not unique to Africa. Once the British left India, India fragmented into Ceylon, into Burma, into what is today Bangladesh, at one time East Pakistan, and into Pakistan. These countries like Bhutan and, and Nepal, they were all India. Once the colonialists left, the tribal and religious identities took over and they fragmented. The mess you have in Iraq, northern Iraq is Kurdish, central Iraq is Sunni, southern Iraq is Shia. Again, these countries in the Middle East, like Jordan and Iraq and so forth, and Syria, Lebanon, they were created by the British and French in the aftermath of World War I. <laughs> Once the British left, 
It collapsed. You see these federal systems even in Europe. Once Marshal Tito was dead, Yugoslavia broke up and there were genocidal wars in Bosnia and Herzegovina between the Serbs, the Croats. These things are not peculiar to Africa. We can understand some of these things in terms of tribalism, ethnic identity, religious disparity, and so forth. But there's something else. False religion. Christianity has grown fast in Africa. And there are many faithful Christians who are being persecuted by Muslims. But there is a propensity in Africa, even among people claiming to be evangelical and Pentecostal, to combine Christianity with animism, where the pastor becomes the new witch doctor or Sangoma. <laughs> in tribal Africa, it's acceptable for the Sangoma or the witch doctor to be rich even though the people are poor. That gets into the church. They become sitting ducks for the word, faith, name, and claim it gospel. Financial exploitation of African Christians is unbelievable. It has even been exported into Great Britain and to a degree America. The money preachers from the United States and South Africa, the white ones, knew this. They were an easy touch, an easy target. And then the black pastors began imitating it. Not all of them. But you've got con job Christianity among African Pentecostals on a widespread scale. Unfortunately, the places where the church is faithful is where they're facing persecution. This is a tragedy, a lack of qualified leadership. The practice of muti, charms and things that they get from a witch doctor. Now it becomes you bring the pastor your Bible and you bring him your wallet and he anoints it with oil. It's the same thing, they're practicing muti. You have people in, in South Africa. They'll say they're born again and go to church and sing hallelujah, and they will go home and sleep on bricks because they're afraid of something called the takalash, the boogeyman. They hold to pagan belief and Christian belief at the same time instead of coming down on the side of Christianity. This was the problem in the church in Corinth. People were bringing their pagan baggage into the church and confusing it with the teachings of the New Testament. Now again, you had a Roman Catholic version of the same thing in Haiti with voodoo, where the people would practice Catholicism and they would practice voodoo simultaneously, and they still do. Well, the same thing happens in Africa, only it becomes Pentecostalism and, and the equivalent of voodoo, who actually came originally from Africa. False religion breeds ignorance and poverty. True faith in Jesus brings salvation, but it will also bring upward mobility. I don't mean a gospel of health and wealth, but I do mean when people live by biblical standards, as John Wesley said, it will increase their standard of living eventually. When uneducated people or illiterate people become Christians, they want to read the word of God, right away they become literate. I've seen this in the movement of God among the gypsy people in Europe. People in their 60s and 70s could never read, and then they want to read as soon as they get saved because they want to read the scripture. Well, the people begin to become literate, they become more educated. Now, there is a true gospel of health and wealth, but it's not the one of the money preachers. That's the con. But living by biblical principles is going to make people more educated and, because of biblical stewardship, more prosperous. But, of course, this is being corrupted and conned by the money preachers and the seduction of combining it with the pagan religions of tribal Africa. These are Africa's problems, this tribalism, this mixture of paganism with Christianity, and the Islamic persecution of Christians. Tragedy. Something else that happens in a tribal mentality is this. When the chief or a chief goes forward at an altar call, everybody will follow him. They're not following Jesus, they're following the chief. They're not going forth necessarily because the Holy Spirit is convicting them of their sin. 
they're going forth because of the tribal mentality. That's what you do. These are the kinds of problems you have in Africa, in post-colonial Africa. And again, I say this as somebody who was not an imperialist. I don't like colonialism. But I can't deny the fact that independence has not served most of the black people of Africa very well. It's terrible. Wasn't the injustices, the racism of apartheid bad enough that black people are actually worse off in terms of life expectancy and infant mortality and unemployment now than they were then? Things you wouldn't believe. Traditional healers, witch doctors, and gormers having the right from the AMC to walk on hospital wards in the name of the rediscovery of black identity and liberation from being Europeanized. The witch doctors in South Africa were actually telling people, not only if you rape a white woman, you'll be healed of AIDS, but if you rape your baby, you'll be healed of AIDS. They were sodomizing newborn sons. You can see posters in bus stations throughout South Africa. Having sex with your newborn baby will not cure your AIDS. Shocking, unbelievable. The plight of black people in black countries is far worse than the plight of black people in the United States or Western countries. But they don't want to tell you that. It's not politically correct, even though it's indisputably true. Now let's understand this. Bigamy is another problem. Polygamy is another problem in Africa. There are people who claim to be Christian who have multiple wives. Again, this goes back, this is our ancient identity, our tribal identity. So they do what the Muslims do, have multiple wives. And then they go to church. Jacob Zuma has four wives, the president of South Africa, and he's an ordained minister in some kind of a supposedly evangelical church. This is ridiculous. But it's no more ridiculous than people like Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson. The Lord's ministers are to be above reproach. Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition, soliciting money from corporations and foundations to help inner city black youth. Paying an extravagant salary, six figure salary, to the mother of his love child born out of wedlock to keep her quiet. Then he gets caught. And he's allowed to stay in the ministry, and he is their role model. That's your role model? Three out of four black children in the United States now born out of wedlock, including the son of their leader. This is terrible. This is a shame and a disgrace. The pro-homosexual position of Al Sharpton. Yet I heard him on the radio calling... Homosexuals are derogatorily homos. He knows it's against black culture, but he promotes that agenda. These are ministers. These are people who claim to be preachers, the ministers of the Lord, of the church. What's going on here? Something is very much wrong. What does the word of God say? Let's understand something. I'm not trying to make a political speech. I'm simply stating facts. The abolitionism that ended slavery in the British Empire and in the United States came from gospel preachers influenced by biblical principles. The civil rights movement came from committed Christians well before Martin Luther King and God bless his memory, Medgar Rivers, who was also tragically murdered. That was the origin of it. Black America has turned away from the faith of their grandparents and great-grandparents that gave them emancipation, gave them civil rights. Why is it 50 years later after civil rights, black people on the average are no better off than they were? How can you blame the white establishment for the fact that three out of four black people born today are born out of wedlock? 
every statistical study, going back to the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was the first to warn about it, a Democrat. The chances of a child being born out of wedlock of finishing high school, let alone college, are very low. The chances of a child born out of wedlock winding up in the criminal justice system are very high. God ordained the family. The scriptures speak more of a father's love than a mother's love. What is responsible for this moral bankruptcy that has overtaken so much of America, but particularly hard hit is black America? What is the reason for this? Is it because black people are just morally depraved and have the mark of Cain? No. It's because, like the rest of America, they turn from the faith of their fathers. They turn from the faith of their fathers. That's why it's happening. You can't blame other people for the consequences and ramifications of your own sin. Oh, we're underprivileged because we're black. No, you're underprivileged now because you don't believe what your Baptist grandmother or your Pentecostal grandfather believed. And then you're turning to Islam as a religion of black liberation? That's insane. Once people turn from the truth, they become illogical, irrational in their thinking. Not just black people, anyone who turns from the truth of Jesus will become irrational in their thinking, trying to justify what's wrong. Now look, I'm not making a political speech here. My family is a mixture of Irish and Jewish. Both of them have sad and sorry histories. In the 19th century, a black slave had one advantage over an Irishman or a Chinese immigrant. A black slave had a capital value. He or she were worth money. An Irishman wasn't. So high-risk jobs like digging coal mines where they had children doing it, cavings, black lung disease, or digging the canals in New Orleans with the landslides and people being drowned, things like this, in the Mississippi Delta. They use Irish immigrants, blasting the passages through the Sierra Madre Mountains in California for the railroad. They use Chinese. Why? You can't use a black person. He's worth money. You can sell him. But you can always get another Chinese person or another Irishman. They were in shanty towns. Their socioeconomic conditions were as bad as that of blacks, but they don't tell you that. The American Civil War. The northern industrial robber barons had no love for blacks. They treated the Irish and the Chinese just as bad, and they would later treat the blacks up north just as badly. They didn't care. It was about money. You had a fight between the old money of the south, the plantation owners, who had a, trend, a tradition going back to James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington as the power elites based on agriculture and slavery and agronomic economy, or the people in the North were more influenced by Alexander Hamilton. Now there's a musical using Afro-American music about, about Alexander Hamilton on Broadway. It's very successful. Hamilton had a more industrial vision for America in the 1700s. So these people who were in the steel and iron industries and things like this wanted to compete with Great Britain they wanted the power from the people in the South. It became about money and power. The mistreatment of the black slaves and the mistreatment of the Irish, the, 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 the Chinese, it didn't matter. Now, there were individuals who were true abolitionists who didn't agree with slavery, who had conviction. That's for sure. But these things were about money, struggles for power. In both the North and the South. After the war, something happened. One of the worst things that ever happened in American history was the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. 
Had he lived, the period of reconstruction would have been that, a reconstruction. You would have had an industrialization of the South that was delayed by nearly 100 years before the South industrialized. Up to the 20th century, did the Sun Belt industrialize. Why? Because the Reconstruction became an occupation. It gave these northern robber barons the opportunity they wanted to occupy and exploit the South. The result was carpetbaggers, like Hillary Clinton today is a carpetbagger, somebody who goes from one state to another seeking political power. After the Whitewater scandal, she couldn't get elected in Arkansas, so she came to live in New York as an opportunist. And then there were the scalawags who helped her. <laughs> Another byproduct of Reconstruction becoming an occupation in the South was the rise of the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan. This resulted in Jim Crow. Slavery by another name. Oh, slavery's gone. We'll just arrest the blacks for any crime we can and put them on a chain gang. The institution of slavery was, in a sense, perpetuated simply by another name. There was the Klan. There was Jim Crow. All propagated by the Democratic Party, by the way. Senator Byrd from West Virginia had been a member of the Klan. He only died about 10 years ago. Now you think about this. George Faber, the mentor of Bill Clinton, voted against the Civil Rights Act. Al Gore's father, a U.S. Senator, voted against the Civil Rights Act. These were all Southern Democrats. One of the Clintons, one is Jimmy Carter. One is the sad soul who's running with Hillary Clinton now, her vice presidential running mate. Southern Democrats, the party of slavery and the party of Jim Crow. <clears throat> Again, not to be political, but what happened when Clinton was president? <laughs> So-called welfare reform. And a crackdown on crime that vastly, vastly increased the Afro-American prison population. Put him back in jail! Also something else, seducing the black community into buying into the abortion agenda. They got a solution to the problem of black youth and black crime. Abort them in their mother's wombs or let them shoot each other dead in the streets of Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, and these other cities, all with liberal Democrat governments. I look at the godlessness of San Francisco, where homosexuality runs wild. Most of the entrepreneurs in the high-tech industry in Silicon Valley are Democrats. Mark Zuckerberg and these people, Democrats. People who run Apple are Democrats. Pro-homosexual. You've got the opposite of what you used to have. Instead of people living in the suburbs and commuting to work in the city, now you've got Google buses in San Francisco. They live in the city and commute to work in the Silicon Valley. Where are they getting their homes? Driving blacks and Hispanics out of their neighborhood and making condos of those buildings. The blacks go across the bridge to Oakland into the ghettos. And then you make it a city of refuge. You bring in illegal aliens to take the jobs away from blacks and Hispanic Americans. And then blacks vote for them. Now understand, no Jew would vote for a Nazi. They might be Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, independent, libertarian, whatever, but they would never vote for a Nazi. I live in Great Britain sometimes. No Irish Catholic person in Northern Ireland would ever vote for the Unionist parties. 
because of the potato famine and the black and tan. No Irish person would vote for the Orange Unionist parties. No Jew would vote for Nazi. No white person would vote for the party who did that to them. Thinking white people find it very hard to understand why would a black person vote for the party who did this to you, the party of slavery and Jim Crow, and they're still doing it. Let me tell you how it works. This is not political. I'm stating facts. By not sealing the border, drugs come into the country, fueling gang violence. Fourth of July weekend, 2016, over 60 blacks shot dead in the streets of Chicago. Black Lives Matter says nothing. <laughs> Say nothing about it. 60 black shot. Some of them shot dead. Some of them kids. Too bad that black lives don't matter to black lives matter. They turned against the fate of their parents. These drugs are fueling this crime. Instead of standing up against the drugs and against the immorality and the breakdown of the family and the godlessness, you make a big deal out of every cop who gets out of line. And not every cop who shoots is wrong. But they racialize everything. A Hispanic shoots Trayvon Martin. All of a sudden, a Hispanic becomes a white person. When it's in their advantage, a Hispanic is not a white person, but the, when it's the, now he's all of a sudden white. A Hispanic police officer shoots a black person. His name was Heronimo, Geronimo, <laughs> Heronimo, uh, uh, Juarez or something of this nature. The government, the governor of... Minnesota stands up, the Democrat, this is racist. It was a Hispanic, not a black. With Eric Garner in New York, he was put in a chokehold and killed. The officer in charge was a black female police sergeant. If they racialize these things, oh, it's white cops doing this to blacks. Meanwhile, for every incident, Involving a policeman, there are 58 blacks shot dead by other blacks. There is a moral breakdown. It's not even rational. When people turn from the faith of the scriptures, they can't even think rationally anymore. They will blame anybody and everybody but themselves. Cities of refuge, illegal immigrants being brought in to take jobs away from blacks and Hispanics, and you still vote for the people. People don't think rationally. Now again, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm an independent, and I don't want to endorse any candidate. My appeal is not to vote for this one or vote for that one. My appeal is to return to the faith of your fathers. Unless that happens, there is no hope for America, and there's certainly no hope for black America. Under Barack Obama, a 58% increase in the number of blacks on food stamps, black unemployment going up 28, 29%. The lie that unemployment has gone down to 5%, but it's double in the black community, that's a lie. The federal statistics don't count people who have dropped out of the workforce the labor participation rates, when you look at the real figures, it's much, much higher, particularly in the black community. You're talking 20%, nearly 50% of black youths under the age of 25 are unemployed. We go back to Silicon Valley, more Democrats, more liberals, more people who don't have godly values, and Republicans are no better, I'm not saying they are. What happens? They're importing graduate students from Taiwan, Korea, Singapore, 
to these high paid, high tech jobs. One third of those jobs are going to Asians. The future of America is this. The largest amount of up, upstart companies and small businesses in the United States are begun by Hispanic Americans, Americans of Hispanic descent, American citizens, or legal immigrants. Unfortunately, federal regulation is choking the death out of these businesses, yet Hispanics likewise get bamboozled to vote for the same parties who do this, the small businesses. Nonetheless, Hispanics are demographically the largest minority now, and they are opening the most businesses. That's upward mobility. Native Americans, at least the ones with casinos on their tribal homelands near major cities and resorts, to which they're entitled to be tax-free, even though I don't condone gambling. Asians just getting off the boat from the Far East, upwardly mobile. Fewer than 2% of those jobs in high-tech industries go to blacks. Most of them go to white people, and a third go to Asians, even newly arrived Asian graduate students. Why is it? that IQs among blacks are lower than among white people and Asians. It's not genetic. It is not genetic inferiority. It can't possibly be. It is genetic among Muslims. Muslims have a lower IQ than Westerners on the average because of inbreeding, marrying cousins, uncles marrying their nieces and things like this. They are genetically predisposed to condemn the lineacy. The lower intelligence in the Muslim world compared to the Western world is genetic, but it's not among blacks, at least not among most blacks. You've got Dr. Ben Carson, probably the best pediatric brain surgeon in the world, formerly chief of pediatric neurosurgery at John Hopkins. You've got a black rocket scientist and mathematician like Herman Cain who becomes a very successful businessman. You've always had people like George Washington Carver, the founder of modern food science. You've always had a disproportionately large amount of black talent and ability in creative fields, particularly music. People like Billy Strayhorn and Duke Ellington and so forth. Obviously, blacks are not genetically inferior. In the Muslim world, there's a genetic inferiority because of inbreeding, but not among blacks. No, it's cultural. Schools are no good, no father, no role model. Black kids being bullied in school by other blacks if they do well and take the study seriously, you turn white, man. So they tell them sometimes. Let me tell you about a school I know of in Harlem, in Manhattan. This church called Soul Saving Station. They decided to have a Christian school that was run on biblical principles. Every one of those kids graduated. Every one of those kids went on to college or university. Every one of them. Because Jesus was there. Grant maintained schools. You've got crooked teachers unions that are not about education. They're about social engineering, creating a permanent underclass. The only thing that teachers unions are or political campaign funds for left-wing politicians. That's why they're against grant-maintained schools. That's why you got these people like the Blasio in New York are against it. They don't want the black people to have a good education. They'll be upwardly mobile. You have to create a victim mentality. Why this breakdown of the family? Blacks have no morals? No, blacks had a traditionally high moral standard because of Baptist and Pentecostal churches. It's because the party of Jim Crow made food stamps the new supporter of the family. You don't need a husband and a father. You just need to get in line and get your food stamps. What does the New Testament say? If a man does not work, neither should he eat. 
I was in Jersey City, New Jersey yesterday. I was looking at situations with black women. I have up to five children from three different men, and they're all on welfare and food stamps. The fathers aren't supporting them. The New Testament says if a man doesn't work, he should eat. Well, I can't get a job. The legal aliens have taken them. They've actually created this mentality where food stamps and welfare becomes the, the, the support of the family instead of the father and husband. What kind of a chance will those children have? But if you went back to God's principles, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat, he doesn't take care of his family, he's worse than a heathen. Slavery? A man stealer. Somebody who abducts somebody to make them a slave, they should be executed. That's the truth. My heart breaks for these children in the black community and in the Hispanic community. What chance are they going to have? The faith in Jesus that brought about support for abolitionism. The faith in Jesus that brought about civil rights is gone. Once more, you have slavery with a new name. After slavery, it was Jim Crow. Put the blacks on a chain gang. Then it became three strikes and you're out. Cracking down on crime is one thing, but when you take people's jobs away and, and their ability to get a job and give it to somebody with no right to be in the country, oh boy. It's a corrupt system. It's fixed to keep the black man down. But he's part of it. What used to be Uncle Tom's in the days of Simone Legree, now you've got political Uncle Tom's, black poverty cracks, blacks with a vested interest in perpetuating the status quo. Donna Brazil, Barack Obama, Al Sharpton. This is how these people keep themselves in power and in pocket, is by perpetuating the victim mentality and creating the underclass. Forget about Christian schools or grant maintained schools based on godly principles. Well, no, we want the teachers unions. The teachers unions give tenure to bad teachers. They don't protect good ones. They're about social engineering, not education. It's about common core, federal control, social engineering. Create a permanent underclass of blacks and other minorities to keep corrupt people in power. Again, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican, and I'm not telling you who to vote for. But what I am telling you is this hopeless situation is the result of nothing more than turning away from the faith that was believed by Frederick Douglass, that was believed by Booker T. Washington, that was believed by George Washington Carver, that was believed by many, many, many Afro-American Christians. They didn't have any money but they had Jesus. They had morality. In the late 1940s, in the ugliest days of Jim Crow, you had black veterans who fought on D-Day in the beaches, being strung up and lynched by the Klan in the late 1940s, in the Deep South. I remember Jim Crow. I'm old enough. Driving to Florida on vacation with my parents as a kid, I remember, this is Klan country, white only, I saw it, I'm old enough to remember Jim Crow. But you know, in the late 1940s, fewer than one out of ten Afro-American children were born out of wedlock. Now, 50 years after civil rights, three out of four were born out of wedlock. Blame the devil. 
It can blame corrupt politicians who make food stamps and welfare the replacement for a husband and a father and who take the jobs away from blacks. The upward mobility, first step jobs at least, and give them to people with no legal right to be in the country, you can blame them. You can blame those who are against private education to keep a permanent underclass of uneducated social minorities. But ultimately, you've got to blame yourself. This moral breakdown is the direct result of turning away from Jesus. And then to turn away from the faith in Jesus, which was the only thing that ever did the black man any good, in order to go to Farrakhan, a racist himself, and Islam? This is insanity. To turn to these godless ideas of W.E.B. Du Bois and the philosophies of Alenskyism, totally incompatible with what was believed by Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington and others warned about people like Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. They warned about them. That they used the plight of the black to create a power base and a platform for their own aggrandizement. The race industry, the race of crimes. Now again, these political issues are not what I'm about. I'm about scripture. I know there will be no resolution to the problem of black America or black Africa until there is a return to the faith of their parents. I'm going to speak to you straight now. Before I knew Jesus, I was on drugs. In the world of hard drugs, there's no race. There's only people who take drugs and people who don't. I knew black dudes, Hispanic dudes. I used to score in Harlem. I didn't know about drugs. I know about that world. Lighting up the White House in the colors of the homosexual flag emblem. Most black people don't believe in homosexuality. It goes against their culture. You don't see much homosexuality in tribal Africa. You don't see it. It's voting for these political Uncle Toms who don't have any morals, any scruples. They don't believe the faith of your fathers. Unless there's a return to the faith of your fathers. Black America has no future. It's the Asians who have the education and the high paid jobs. It is the Hispanics who have the numbers and the upstart businesses. At least Native Americans have casinos. Not that I like gambling again, I don't. Thou shalt not covet. But what does the black man have? Nothing. You can read that book by America's, or one of America's leading Afro-American journalists, Tavis Smiley, a big Obama supporter, who admits that after two terms of Obama, black people are no better off. Well, he's wrong. Statistically, they're worse off. The unemployment, the crime in the black community, the racial division, the hopelessness, these things have never been worse. Never the worse. And look how Obama pandas to Islam, the religion of black enslavement and oppression, calling Muhammad the prophet. Muhammad the prophet called black people raisin heads. Quite a situation. Slavery in the 21st century, black slaves owned by rich Muslims. <laughs> And Obama and these guys pandered to it. Oh, my Lord, it's crazy. It's insane.
Chairman by the right, Goddamn America, Obama's mentor. He preached a sermon, Goddamn America. Tell the black people in Haiti who are desperate to get to America that America should be damned. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in Africa. We run orphanage for AIDS children in Africa, our ministry. Spent a lot of time in Africa and in East Africa and in South Africa, working with AIDS children. I can't seek to find too many black Africans who don't want to come to the United States. They'll gladly live in a council estate or a housing estate or a housing project. You know what? The housing project has become the new plantation. And the party of slavery and the party of Jim Crow, those Southern Democrat politicians are the same ones who are still holding the black man down and Islam is still enslaving black people. And they get themselves over to it. And when you see blacks who see through this and who are governed by biblical principles like Sheriff Clark or Dr. Alan Keyes or others, just think of it. The, the best social economist in the world is a black American. The best political economist in the world is a black American. Professor Walter Williams and Dr. Thomas Sowell the black America, listen to them, they're the two best economists in the world. But they don't listen to them. They listen to Al Sharpton. Unless you return to the faith of your grandparents and great grandparents. Unless you return to the faith that engendered the support to abolish slavery and to bring about civil rights. Unless you turn to that faith, there is no hope whatsoever. There's no political solution. There is no political solution unless there is first a theological solution. Unless there is a spiritual transformation, a return to Jesus on the basis of scripture and the black community, no government program, policy, or law is going to work. We've had 50 years of this kind of legislation, and black people are no better off. And they will never be any better off unless they return to Jesus Christ. And that's not only true of blacks, believe me. But right now, we're talking about blacks. These things, this plight of black people in Africa, in Haiti, and in the United States, has nothing, nothing to do with the mark of Cain. It has everything to do with sin and abandoning the truth of Jesus Christ, of turning away from what your dear godly grandmother, the Pentecostal lady, or the Baptist lady, who lived a godly life and loved Jesus, who's now with him in glory. Your granny was right. You are wrong. It's not about the market key. What you need is the mark of Jesus. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you.